So today we are we talk about Mesopotamia, talk about censorship. Sorry, can you turn that piece off, please? I've never that is. Mesopotamia, do we know what that is? Have we heard of that? Uh, hopefully we have. All right, Mesopotamia has to do with the Middle East. Okay, it is located in uh, Iraq, and uh, it's part of what we call the Fertile Crescent, which is with Iraq, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Okay, uh, but we'll talk more about that as we go. We talk about censorship. Okay, what is censorship? What does it mean to censor something? Give me what you think. Good. Yeah, you're prohibiting it from being shown or spread to the general public. All right. Uh, so we'll take a look at censorship in Saudi Arabia. All right. There's obviously other countries that censor information. All right. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the United States and kind of how we treat censorship. And you know, those would be our two topics for today. All right. You got two assignments. Pretty brief, so you should be able to get both of them done today. I'm going to try to give you about a half hour to complete them. All right. Uh, so, first thing we're going to do is watch CNN. They're talking about uh, more the uh, the shortage of water right now in Texas. All right. So, uh, I know that <clears throat> hopefully you guys have heard about the blackouts in Texas okay the uh, most of the population did not have power for uh, a few days there uh, last week and it's, it's starting to come back on now and uh, more and more of getting access to water but there's still people that are going to be without it for the next couple days uh, and that's just because of the unpreparedness of the Texan government and energy groups. So uh, that's what we're going to be looking at today. Right. Uh, so watch this and we'll get going. grateful to have you kicking off the new week with us. My name is Carl Azus. This is CNN 10. As of Sunday, there were more than 14 million people in the U.S. state of Texas who still didn't have reliable running water. Authorities were able to get electricity running again for many of them, though tens of thousands were still in the dark and the cold over the weekend. And outside, thermometers finally climbed back up to the 60s and 70s on Sunday, following a week of record cold temperatures and record amounts of snow. That led to record-breaking demand for electricity in the state, and that coincided with several major sources of power breaking down. Water pipes froze and burst in unheated homes. Water pipes froze and burst in hundreds of water systems. Problems were reported in more than 1,300 public systems last week. That affected four-fifths of all the counties in Texas and roughly half the state's population. Many people were put under boil water advisories. That means that even if their water was running, it might not have been safe to drink. So residents were advised either to use bottled water or to boil for one minute any tap water they planned to use for drinking, preparing food, brushing teeth, or even giving to pets. There have been some uplifting stories that have come out of Texas's hardships. Volunteers have been giving away hot meals and warm clothing to those in need. A furniture store owner opened his business to thousands of people who came in for warmth, and he allowed hundreds to sleep on his new mattresses, which he'll later sell at a discount. Many other Texans who've been hunkered down without somewhere else to go have been using snow to keep systems running in their homes. The water's not even... The lights may be on, but across parts of Texas, the water isn't. 
drinking water still needed. There's a panic move that we didn't have enough drinking water. We would love showers, but we will we'll get that when we when we get our water turned back on. Texans waiting in long lines just to pick up cases of water, with nearly half of the state under boil water advisors. This is a community of people that are scared and upset and, and angry. Uh, we're eventually going to need some better answers. For right now, we're just trying to get water to our neighbors. But it's not just drinking water. Some residents can't even flush the toilet without melting snow. We relocated back to our house, five adults and two dogs, um, and we started harvesting snow because we had also lost water at that point, um, harvesting snow for toilet water. President Joe Biden approving a major disaster declaration for Texas, freeing up more help from FEMA. You know, when disaster strikes, this is not just an issue for Texans, this is an issue for our entire country. Disasters don't strike everyone equally. When you already have so many families in the state and across the country that are on the brink that can't even afford an emergency to begin with, when you have a disaster like this, it can just set people back for years. And as residents wait for the water and power to come back, some still forced to use their cars for warmth. Others, if they're lucky, find shelter in a hotel. The guests Frankly, it's been the equivalent of camping indoors. And moving forward, officials here are going to start looking at what exactly went wrong over this past week. And among what they're investigating is that many customers here in Texas reported getting extremely high power bills, even amid this catastrophe. So Texas officials are investigating that. And then on the waterfront, when could we see the water come back to Texas? Well, in some places, we're well on our way. In Houston, for example, they've reached that minimum threshold for water pressure. And here in Austin, officials are optimistic they can get water citywide by the end of the weekend. The first pictures have come in from NASA's latest mission to Mars. Last Thursday, the $2.7 billion Perseverance mission logged the ninth successful Mars landing by the United States. That's significant in part because roughly half the missions to the Red Planet have failed. The Perseverance rover has been going through a series of checks after arriving on Mars' surface. Sending back these images is one of the first things it's done. Perseverance landed in a crater where scientists think a lake might have been billions of years ago. So over the course of its two-year mission, Perseverance is set to travel 15 miles investigating the crater and its rocks. Second trivia. Which of these countries has a national holiday that marks an event from 1789? United Kingdom, Morocco, France, or Argentina? France's national holiday marks the anniversary of the storming of the Bastille prison. In France right now, schools are open, certain shops are open, churches and public libraries are open. You have to wear a mask everywhere you go, and almost everything shuts down by 6 o'clock p.m. In fact, the coronavirus-related curfew requires most French men and women to stay at home from dusk to dawn. And restaurants, movie theaters, gyms, and museums, they're all shut down. That includes the Louvre, one of the most famous museums on the planet. It usually costs about $18 to get inside, but the doors have been shut to visitors since October, and while the museum has lost millions in revenue during this time, it has gained an opportunity to catch up on quiet projects. The world's most visited museum awakens, but there are no visitors here. Escalators that once carried 40,000 pairs of feet a day whistle in the eerie emptiness brought on by COVID restrictions. Liberty and the Mona Lisa are having a break from their usual crowds of admirers. What were bustling halls now take mere minutes to walk through. Sculptures forced into hibernation in this Renaissance palace. But they're not completely alone. It's still living, even though it seems uh, really uh, asleep from the outside. Since October, when the Louvre closed, hundreds of artisans have been working five days a week to refurbish and rejuvenate with a stroke of a brush or the crank of a forklift. 
we have all the arts that are being uh, stored or just uh, uh, studied by the, the curators. We have uh, all the maintenance work that obviously can't stop. So it's uh, really rewarding. The stakes are pretty high, let's say. You don't want to, uh, to spoil what people have, uh, have been uh, building in centuries. Not since World War II has the Louvre been shuttered to the public for so long. Last year, it lost 90 million euros in revenue. But curators here say they have gained something more valuable, time. The rhythm of the exposition is so intense que c'est vrai que ça nous voilà ça, ça porte du stress et c'est le, le plaisir aussi de pouvoir euh, avoir une réflexion calme et à long terme sur euh, ce qu'on veut montrer au, au Louvre parce que tout à coup un tableau paraît trop grand trop petit ou alors le cadre euh, ne convient pas avec ceux du voisinage il faut être à l'écoute de ce que les œuvres ont à dire et parfois euh, certaines ne, ne s'aiment pas les unes les autres il faut les séparer these 19th century doors that once opened into the bedchamber of French kings are being restored to their former beauty. And you have just different layers that are meant to uh, recreate all in all the veins of the wood because you have, you know, uh, so many different colors uh, when you look that closely. On a des soies synthétiques qui sont très douces. Là, on a un blaireau, donc c'est des poils de blaireau. Euh, ici, on a un spalter, c'est de la soie de porc, enfin chaque euh, poil. <rire> These doors will be finished in three weeks. When the Louvre will reopen is anyone's guess. The belief here is that art comes alive through the public's eye. Until then, the museum prepares for its resurrection. Saskia Van Dorn, CNN, Paris. <coughs>2 billion dollars to build it, you know, obviously test it and then launch it for a uh, they're, I think they're about 50% in terms of success. And luckily this one was successful. Uh, but man, that's a lot of money spending on researching Mars. But uh, yeah, that's NASA um, and what the United States is spending on that. Okay, hopefully there's something that will become productive out of that because you know you're spending two billion dollars hopefully you can figure out um, to use that information in a useful way 
Alright. All right. So if you guys don't have it out already, go ahead and get your Chromebooks out. Okay. Roll your Chromebook. Okay. Get that out for us. Okay, we're going to Canvas. Uh, modules. Go to week eight instructions. And we're going to go to Quizlet. Okay. We looked at these. Well, we wouldn't have looked at these. I'm trying to think. You guys were the vocab yesterday? Or not yesterday, last week during class? I'm trying to think. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We did Tuesday. Uh, I can't remember though for sure. Okay. Now, if we haven't looked at these yet, I would suggest going through flashcards or just go through the term and definition and kind of scroll your way down, work your way through the terms. If you have, um, I would you know challenge yourself. Okay. Use match or gravity okay. uh, to study these. Okay. I'm only going to give you about three or four minutes to go through these. But um, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to review these because in, we're a little bit of ways, but about three weeks, we'll have our vocab quiz on this, okay, over 25 terms, very similar to what we did with the uh, vocab terms with Africa. Okay, it'll be timed, graded, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, but we have some time to uh, get to know these. Okay, so three or four minutes to study these.
All right, sorry, just a little bit more than I thought. All right, so you can exit out of your Quizlet, and okay, we don't need that anymore. Now, the uh, the next thing we're talking about is Mesopotamia. Okay, right. and I give you guys sheets. If uh, you're on, you're online. Okay, you need to go to Week Eight Instructions and wait for me until I explain how to get there. All right, it's going to be a short reading, but we're going to just talk about a few things here. Uh, so if you go to Week Eight Instructions, okay, you're going to want to open up the Mesopotamia reading. All right, for those of you in class, you've already 
the other on the piece of paper. And this is uh, the reading that we have in our hand. Okay, those of you on the Google Meet, this is what you need to get open. It's a one page reading that we're going to do together. Uh, we're going to ignore this top part of the questions. We're going to answer two, three, four, and five together. All right, we're going to do together. All right. I'm going to read this out loud for us, right? Um, make sure we're going to talk about it as we go through it. Uh, just give me one second, guys. Mesopotamia. Right, that's what we're talking about here. Okay, this is the Mesopotamia literally literally means in between two rivers. We're talking about it between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Right? So here we go on the text here. Before they settled down in various parts of the world, humans lived as nomads for tens of thousands of years. Nomads are people who have no permanent home and travel in search of food and safety. Right? So this is pre-Mesopotamia that we're just talking about. Okay, before, you know, they just roamed. They traveled uh, to different places and moved along. Okay, after they have exhausted their resources, they have to move on to find new fresh water, more food, right? uh, yada, yada, yada. Okay? Uh, a typical nomadic, nomadic group might include an extended family of about 10 adults and their children. They would temporarily camp in an area for a few weeks or months. Then <clears throat> the men hunting animals and the women gathering fruits, grains, seeds, and nuts when the nomads exhausted the resources in that area, they moved on. All right, so that is pre-Fertile Crescent. Okay? Civilizations developed slowly in different parts of the world. People began to settle in areas with abundant national, natural resources for thousands of years. People have been attracted to a part of the world archaeologists later called the Fertile Crescent, which is this here, which includes the Egyptian uh, people as well as Mesopotamia. Right. The Fertile Crescent is a boomerang-shaped region that extends from the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf. It is a rich, food-growing area in a part of the world where most of the land is too dry for farming. So of the best farmland of the Fertile Crescent is on a narrow strip of land between the Tigris and Euphrates. The two rivers have traveled. The two rivers travel in the same direction for thousands of miles before they combine to drain into the Persian Gulf. The Greeks called this area Mesopotamia, which means between the rivers. Very little rain falls in Mesopotamia, but water and nutrients from the river soak into the land, create an environment filled with plants and animals that feed on the vegetation. Okay, so that's talking about this area right here on the picture. Okay, just Mesopotamia. But what other area has a massive river that allows a large city to operate even though it's located in a desert? Yeah, the Egyptians. Okay, and it's right here on the map as well. Okay, we're talking about Cairo. Okay, uh, but you know, rivers allow places that do not receive a whole lot of rainfall to still operate. Okay, uh, and to really flourish. All right, so uh, it doesn't take an area to have a lot of rainfall in order for a large population to occur. Right, uh, it just you have to have a source of fresh water. So rivers are your next best thing. 
Many different civilizations flourished in this small region. The Sumerians slowly developed one of the first civilizations in the southeastern section of Mesopotamia as early as 7,500 years ago. Okay, so the Sumerians are the first ones who actually have a civilization, okay, large numbers. Right? Uh, they're the first. Okay. The Babylonians formed a centralized government. Oh, sorry, no, I skipped here. The Sumerian civilization lasted more than 3,000 years, but in time, the Sumerians lost their influence. The Babylonians formed a centralized government under King Hammurabi. Okay, has anybody heard of the Hammurabi's Code? Morning, sorry for the interruption. Teachers, at this time, please release seniors who need a school picture with the last name starting E through H. Seniors, please report directly to the auditorium. Again, any senior needing a picture with the last name starting E through H, please report to the auditorium. Thank you. Has anybody heard of Hammurabi's Code? Yeah? What is it? Can you tell me? Or have you just heard the name? Heard the name. Okay. Uh, this is, have we heard the saying, an eye for an eye? Okay, this is, this is what this comes from. Hammurabi's Code is all about if I, if, I, if I am to break the law, whatever I did to you, you're going to do to me. Okay? Or the government is going to do that to me. Okay? Because they're the, the Babylonians are the first to actually form a centralized government. Have leadership involved to rule over the group. Okay, uh, and you know, in this case, Hammurabi okay, establishes the rule of law to be whatever I do to you, that is going to be done to me. Okay, like let's say I steal. Okay, well I took something. They're gonna cut off my hand now. Okay, that's that's an eye for an eye type of deal. Uh, if I'm a builder, I build a house for someone, and that house collapses on that family. What do you think happens to me and my family? Probably not to be killed. Because if I've killed that family, that's going to be done to me. So it's all about, you know, as much as harsh as that sounds, okay, the idea behind this is to accept responsibility for your actions. Uh, yes, I understand that's very uh, harsh and you know, it may not even be your fault, but if it's deemed your fault, this is going to happen to you. Okay. That's during Babylonian rule though. Okay. Um, the Babylonian culture lasted from about 1770 BC to about 1595 BC. Various other cultures dominated part of part or all of the Fertile Crescent, including Amorites, Kissites, the Hittites, and the Assyrians. And the land known as Mesopotamia was later controlled by the Persians, the Greeks under Alexander the Great, the Romans, and the Ottoman Turks. The land between the Tigris and the Euphrates has been part of the modern nation of Iraq since 1932. Now that's a lot of people that have controlled that area. I mean, that's quite a bit. Why do you think there's so many people trying to control that area? Why do people want this land? Why does anybody want land? The more land you control, the more what do you have? What do you think? Cody, what do you think? If you have more land, what do you have more of? Power. Okay, power. You know, in terms of land size, the more you have, the more power you have. Okay? Um, what else? What does it possess? Resources. Resources. Absolutely. What type of resources, Jimmy? Like, you know, gold. Food and stuff. All right, I'll agree with the food, but the metals thing, yeah, it's got a little bit of gold, but not really. Uh, nothing that's really attracting the area. But it is, you know, a area where it's pretty arid. You know, a lot of desert. Okay, this area of Mesopotamia gives the ability to grow food. Okay, because they have what? What do they have? That gives the ability to grow food. Mm -hmm. Land. What else? What, what has to go with the land in order to grow crops? Water. Water. Yeah, it's simpler than you think. Okay. And the Tigris and the Euphrates supply that. 
right? You look in this area, there is not a whole lot of rivers that flow, okay? So having access to fresh water really makes this area of the Middle East valuable, right? Uh, because obviously fresh water in anywhere in the world is valuable. That's why countries get into these spouting matches because of dams being created, which then restricts the amount of water flow going into their country. Okay, there's a reason why it creates international problems. Fresh water in any time of history is important. Okay? Uh, and it's becoming even more important in modern times. All right, All right let's read this little section down here in the bottom left with natural boundaries. And the Tigris and Euphrates are natural boundaries that were formed by nature instead of being drawn by people. Okay, examples of natural boundaries include rivers, mountains, ranges, or deserts. Straight lines on a map generally signify borders made by people. While natural borders can follow many different paths, this is easy to demonstrate on a map of the U.S. Most of the boundaries of the western states are straight lines. Okay, Colorado and Wyoming <coughs> are rectangles. Many eastern states have jagged shapes because of their borders are formed by rivers. Okay. Uh, you know, Indiana is kind of a, a mix of those two. Okay. We have straight lines on the east, west, and north, but the southern border is created by what? The Ohio River. Yeah, the Ohio River. Yeah, river. And the Ohio River creates our border between Indiana and Kentucky. Right. Now, the river creates Mesopotamia. Okay, because remember, Mesopotamia literally means between the rivers. Right. So the Tigers and Euphrates are those natural boundaries. Right. Uh, just like you know, we've got to make a mistake. Um, let's say the Mississippi River, right? Mississippi River, you know, creates borders for every state that connects it. Right? The Mississippi River doesn't allow uh, a, you know, the river to flow in between a state. Okay? It always is creating a border. Okay, uh, so it's not like you know rivers are just in the United States create borders. It's it's all over the world, okay? Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia. I mean, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, the one thing though, when we look at Africa, which we just got done covering, is who colonized Africa? Does anybody remember what continent colonized Africa? Jaden? Yeah, Europe does. Okay. And how Africa gets colonized is what's called the Berlin Conference. So this is Africa. Okay. This is Africa here. Why Africa has so many straight line countries is because of Europe. Okay. We talked about the Berlin Conference in 1932 or something like that. I can't remember the exact year. But what they do, it's not 1932, it's before that. Maybe it's 1832. I can't remember. But it's the Berlin Conference. Okay, European powers meet. Okay, and what they do is basically, well, I have a port in this area, so I want this section. Okay, well, I, I control this area, and I have, um, you know, Explorers out going through this. Well, I'm going to take this part. Right? Well, I want this northern part because I want the Suez Canal, or I want to build the Suez Canal. Right? Uh, well, I control the western portion of it, and they just start splitting it up, drawing lines. Right? I want the rights to this, 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 and this. Okay? Without having really any real data to back this up on where the line should have been drawn. Right? It wasn't based on natural boundaries. It wasn't based on the people. It was based around European countries wanting certain areas for its natural resources. Okay, uh, and that's what we call you know, man-made boundaries, okay? human boundaries. They were created by people rather than natural resources, or sorry, physical features. Okay, so we come down here. What is the Fertile Crescent? How would you define it? You take a look at the picture. Right? This is the Fertile Crescent. How would you describe it? What is it?
Is Ari, how would you describe it? The Fertile Crescent. Well, what areas does it include? Okay. Mesopotamia, Mediterranean Sea, what else? Egypt, Nile River, yep. I mean, if you want to just describe it in terms of what it encompasses, you got the Tigers, the Euphrates, Mediterranean Sea, the Nile River. Okay, I mean, yeah, that describes the area of where it is located. Yeah, I take that. Okay. Uh, the Fertile Crescent is, it could be the birthplace of the Sumerians. Okay, it's the heart of the civilization uh, in the Middle East. Okay, it's where it all started. I mean, all these things could be included. Okay, look at number three. Dictionary definition of crescent. What do you think that is? You have to look it up. What do you think a crescent is? Jimmy, what's a crescent? It's like a crescent moon. Okay, I mean, that's part of where the name comes from. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, we use the moon. Okay, this, here's the moon. If we see a crescent moon, all right, you're going to see about a third of it. That's really bad, but you get the idea. Right, and this part would be glowing, and that's what you can see from Earth. Okay, you have a crescent shape. It's kind of like a banana or a, a boomerang. And that's what it's shaped like, right? Uh, the second question that goes along with that, you know, what food kind of looks like this? Yeah, I said a banana, but what, what else could be something that looks like this? That sounds like crescent. Yeah, croissant. You know, I don't know if you ever had croissant. It's a nice and fluffy and flaky. Uh, delicious, right? Four, why do you think people choose to settle these areas with abundant natural resources? That is a very obvious question, but what's the answer? Why do people live in areas with abundant resources? Raul? Why do you think people choose to settle in areas with abundant natural resources? Let's start with this. What resources do you need to survive? Water and food and some type of shelter, right? Okay. So would you personally choose to live in an area where there were very little of these things or a lot of these things? Right, okay, you wanna survive. You want, you want life to be relatively easy, okay? So why do you settle in these areas with abundant natural resources? It's easier to survive. You know, uh, the goal of life is to survive and then at this time, you know, reproduce and, you know, allow your family to keep on going down the generational line. Right? And, you know, at this time, there's a lot of question marks because we don't have reliable agriculture okay, like we do today. Okay, so, you know, this, the possibility of, you know, if you can't find water and food, Starvation then enters the picture. Okay, so settling in an area with a lot of natural resources is very important. And this is what happened in the Fertile Crescent. Okay, people settled there because of the increased amount of water, the ability to grow crops. You know, those are two big things that you need to survive for a long time. All right? Five, what are the natural boundaries of Mesopotamia? What are the what are the, what are the boundaries here? And you can look on that map on the other side or the first page. Okay, what are the boundaries? That's Mesopotamia. Yep. Uh, that's the, the natural boundary, right? Okay, because uh, Mesopotamia literally means what? Lizzie, you remember? What is the what is the meaning of the word just Mesopotamia? Mm -hmm. Remember, Cody? Between the rivers. Yeah, just between the rivers. 
Okay, uh, that is Greek. Yeah, I think it's Greek. That's what I said. Uh, and it's between the Tigers and Euphrates, just like Shaden said. Okay, uh, Fertile Crescent's a little bit different. Okay, you're talking more Egypt, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, than working down towards the Persian Gulf. Okay, we're talking about Mesopotamia there. Okay, uh, so understand this is the a like, cultural herb. This is where you know society begins. Okay, for a lot of what we see as modern society. Okay, this is the beginning, uh, dating back to you know, 1600 BC, 1800 BC. Okay, long time ago. Okay, all right. Let's move on. Uh, you can get rid of these sheets. We're not going to turn those in. So, our next thing is uh, censorship. Okay, you're going to have an end puzzle over censorship. Okay, like Jimmy said at the beginning of class, censorship is not allowing the general public to view information. Okay, uh, so let's talk first about. Talk about countries that actually censor information. Now, here's your top 10 censored countries. Okay. Uh, Eritrea is in what continent? Anybody remember? Number one on the list. Anybody know where that country is in terms of the continent? And this is what? No, this is in Africa. Okay, so this is like on the, like the Horn of Africa. It's located like right here, right next to Djibouti and Somalia. Right, it's right there. North Korea. I hope that's not a surprise. Okay, uh, you know, North Korea is known for censoring the information that the public has access to. Okay, we're talking about the internet here, uh, and I mean. Really, it could be even like texting. Okay? If you're caught talking about critically about your government through a text, uh, you could possibly be punished that way as well. Okay? Uh, but more than anything, we're talking about social media and the media in general. Okay? Uh, Turkmenistan, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about them. But we're going to talk more about Saudi Arabia and China. Those two countries are both very wealthy, but they also censor their uh, their information to the public. Okay. Now, what are some reasons why a country would censor social media or you know articles being published? What are the reasons for censorship? No. So, what do you think? Why would you censor information? Why would you not want certain information to be viewed by the people in your country? What do you mean by that? What, what do you what, what should they not know? Private information. Mm, well, I guess what, what do you mean by private information? Because I agree with you. I just don't know if we're on the same page. I'm not going to explain it. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give you my perspective on private information. Okay? I mean, I would say censorship is a good thing when it comes to private uh, private information. Like the European Union, okay, they made it basically pass the law for anyone in the, in the European Union. If someone requests for data to be deleted on themselves, like you know, they don't want to appear on the internet, they can choose to do that. They'll apply uh, through paperwork. Like I want all of this data. On me and the internet to be deleted. I don't want people to be able to search for me. Okay, you have that option. 
Okay, and that's just in the European Union. We don't have that in the United States. Uh, you could you can pay Google to basically put your name at the end of the list, but in terms of deleting it, no. Nah, when we put something on the internet, it's there forever here in the U.S. Just because we do not we don't allow you know tampering of data in <clears throat> on the internet. Right? Now there's hackers and things of that sort, and that's something that's totally different. Uh, but in terms of censoring or deleting data, you know, we don't do that here in the United States. Okay? Uh, what are the reasons why a country might censor information? We're talking outside of the United States, but we don't do that. Lizzie, what do you think? Why would you why would you censor information? Why would you not allow the public to view certain things on the internet? What is that? What did we just talk about with Raul? Is there anything else? Do I anything to think of? Okay, let's talk about, let's say if a country is super religious. Okay? What are some certain things that religions do not like for people to either do or view? It's weird, but let's say, you know, pornography, okay? Something that religions really look down upon, okay? The, basically the visualization of sex, okay? That is something that censorship is definitely plays a part in, especially Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is super strict with Islamic law, okay? That's one thing that's banned, not allowed to uh, occur in Saudi Arabia, okay? Another thing, okay? Usually, if there is illicit uh, language, okay, it is censored. Okay, uh, cussing is uh, something that is looked down upon by religion. Okay, that's another thing that can be censored. Okay, so things that are, you know, I, mean, I use the word sin, uh, but it could be anything that's looked down upon that is considered immoral to a religion. Okay. That is normally things that are censored within countries that are very religious. Okay? A lot of times, these are Arabic countries. Uh, in terms of like China, China is one of the more uh, larger countries that censors its data. Okay? Like, they don't have Facebook, Twitter, uh, Snapchat. You know, they don't have those things. They have basically apps that the country can control through the government. Okay, so yeah, they have social media, but they produce their own in order to be able to control it. Okay, because if they were allowed to have Facebook uh, within their country, they don't control Facebook. No, that's controlled by a separate company. But if you have you know, a social media platform that the government can control, yeah, you can allow your citizens to use it, but you also monitor it and then sometimes can press charges against people for how they act on social media. Right? Like let's take, you know, in Saudi Arabia. Okay, we have a, I can't remember his name. He's a teenager, okay? Uh, on his Blackberry, he was trying to organize a protest against the government. Okay, try to get people in a mass gathering to protest the government. Um, and, you know, he wants to be having more democratic Government. Well, government sees this on social media, arrests him, sentences to death as a teenager, only for protesting against the government, speaking out against it. Okay, uh, can you imagine the United States if, if that would occur? You know, that's like every day on social media. Uh, you know, half of social media politics, right? Hating on the other side. Right? Uh, being critical of our government no matter what you are, um, Democrat or Republican. Right? It is, you know, even if you're a Democrat, sometimes you're still critical of uh, Biden. Right? Just like if you're a Republican, sometimes you were critical of Trump. Right? It doesn't matter. Right? You disagree with things. But us in the United States, we enjoy a lot of freedoms, a lot of luxuries. Right? And uh, you know, if we didn't have those rights to speak against our government, the freedom of speech, 
Okay? We would be punished for those things if we were still to do them. Okay? Places like Saudi Arabia, China, Turkmenistan, North Korea, if you're going to speak out against your government, okay, you had uh, better be prepared for a lot of repercussions or consequences to come down your way. Okay? And a lot of times, you know, the government doesn't even have to prove any evidence. They can still arrest you. Okay? They'll hold you for a time, and uh, maybe they don't you know, convict you of anything, but uh, they have the rights to hold you for a certain amount of time for whatever reason they feel is the reason that they want. You know? uh, so it's a very uh, eye-opening topic, you know, because in the United States, we just don't think about it. We, for general, in general, we just kind of say what we want. Uh, you know, you can be, you can say the worst thing about the president, and for, for the most part, besides maybe getting backlash from other people, you're not going to be punished, right? Uh, I mean, we have very uh, open freedoms here in the U.S., and I hope you realize that, uh, because you know, you for the most part, unless it borders on the, you know, the line of harassment or bullying or whatever it may be. Yeah, you're, you can generally say whatever the heck you want, okay, uh, without having any real repercussions. Maybe you're punished by the school or by your parents or guardian, then who, whoever. Uh, but in terms of the government stepping in and you know giving you a consequence, and that's just not, we just don't see that here in the U.S. Right? I mean, the only really sen the censorship we've seen in the U.S. is when when do we see this? Censorship in the United States. It happened not too long ago. Last month. Who got banned from Twitter? Trump, Trump. Twitter banned Trump. Yeah. So this is when Twitter banned Trump. And this kind of like then the domino effect, all of these social media platforms banned Trump. Okay. Um, so that is too thick. that's technically considered censorship. Okay. When you're not allowing someone to voice their opinion to the general public. So it is considered censorship, um, but what was the reason for Twitter doing this? Anybody remember? Okay, so Twitter basically said that he was inciting hate speech. Okay, so negative speech about uh, basically Democrats, right? And uh, Twitter said that this was, you know, Allowing for more violence to occur, okay. So they banned his account, okay, and then other social media platforms continue. Now, the the question becomes: Is Twitter allowed to do that here in the United States? Okay, we have free speech rights. Are you allowed to ban someone from your account? And I don't. Know, I would say it's a debatable issue because Twitter is not the government. Right? They're a private company, you know, publicly traded, but they have a, their own CEO, their own owners, okay? they can make their own decisions. So it, it becomes then a, a question of, is that the government limiting speech or is that a private company limiting speech? And does that break the law? That's another question. Uh, so understand that Twitter censoring something is not the same as a government regulated censorship like Saudi Arabia does, like China does. Okay, so they're different things. All right. And what you're gonna do in your assignment, okay, over your head puzzle with Saudi Arabia, okay, how many of you know who Hassan Minaj is? Anybody know who that is? Okay, well, he's pretty, he's like a really popular comedian. Okay. Uh, he is Muslim. Well, I exit out of it, that's fine. Okay. He uh he has his own show, or used to have his own show on Netflix, okay, called Patriot Act, okay, where he basically takes topics that are going on around the world, and obviously he pokes fun at them, but also tries to cover them in a serious manner to spread awareness for people. Uh, and that's what your head puzzle is about. Okay, uh, Understand, yeah, he, he's a very opinionated person. He is. Uh, but he also brings up a lot of good points. Okay, I agree with him on some things. I disagree on certain things. You're allowed to do that. Uh, if it's something that really interests you, if you like him, okay, it's on Netflix, Home Patriot Act, it's also on YouTube. You know, he talks about a lot of interesting topics. Uh, 
And, you know, you don't always have to agree with them. But he does bring up a lot of good points. Okay? So that's one of your assignments. Okay? Watch and listen. It's only three questions. Should be pretty quick. Okay? It's only a six-minute long video. All right? uh, please make sure that you actually answer the last question, which is short answer. Uh, to the best of your ability. Okay? I'm going to give you 100% of the points as long as you give me a direct answer. Okay? Put your thoughts down. Okay? Uh, give me your thoughts and opinions on what do you think the advantages or disadvantages of censorship are. Okay? Uh, and then you have the physical feature map review. Now, this has to do with last semester and this semester. So everything we've covered so far. So it's testing your memory a little bit. Okay? Now, they are all the major ones. Okay? So like the Atlantic Ocean, the Nile River, Okay. Rocky Mountains, some of the bigger ones. Okay, uh, so let's just—I'm just trying to, you know, fall back and kind of take a look at the stuff that we covered last semester and up until now. So you've got North America, South America, Europe, Africa. That's it. Okay, so just a little bit of review here. Get an eighty percent or higher. Screenshot it, attach it, submit it. Those are your two assignments tomorrow. We will take a look at uh, Islam and, more importantly, the Hajj, okay, the pilgrimage to Mecca. That's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. Okay? Uh, but you will not have an assignment on that. Okay? So the goal is to get both assignments done today. You have, you have the time to do it. You have a half hour okay, to get two assignments done. should be easily attainable. Okay? Does anybody have any questions? Is all right? Are you good? Lizzie? Yeah? Jaden, Cody, Joel, okay. Anybody on the Google Meet have any questions? No, yeah, no. I appreciate you guys keep trying to join up. I just saw this, so sorry. Uh, if you don't have any questions, those of you on the Google Meet, you are free to go, and I'll see you tomorrow.